Hey guys, welcome back. I hope you are having an amazing day. Let's get right into the stories. The first one is an entitled people story. I learned a valuable lesson about the importance of home security cameras when I moved into an upscale neighborhood with my wife. As a black man, I didn't anticipate the discrimination we would face, especially from our neighbor. We found our dream home, complete with a beautiful pool and a spacious garden for family gatherings. Little did we know that our neighbor harbored racist beliefs and couldn't fathom two black people living in such a nice house. One fateful day, while enjoying a peaceful swim in our own pool, chaos erupted around me. Three police cars screeched to a halt outside and officers stormed into my backyard, guns drawn. Fear coursed through me as I worried that I might become another tragic headline. Trying to remain calm, I engaged with the officers. Me. What is going on, officer? Officer. We received a call about a trespasser who might be armed and dangerous. Get out of the pool now. Me. Officer, I own this house. If you follow me inside, I can show you the paperwork. As you can see, I'm wearing swim trunks and have no weapons. I won't make any sudden moves and my hands will be visible. I took these precautions because I wanted to ensure my safety and avoid any unjustified violence. Thankfully, after confirming my ownership, the officers calmed down and holstered their weapons. As they prepared to leave, my neighbor, fueled by her racist views, emerged from her house, vehemently demanding my arrest. Neighbor, wait a minute. You have to arrest that man. He was trespassing and swimming in that pool. Officer, ma'am, he owns the house. Please return to your property. Neighbor, he can't possibly own a nice house like that. Just look at him. It was painfully clear that she was driven by racism, using the police to harass me simply because of my skin color. Despite the officer's repeated explanations, she persisted in her prejudiced delusion. I hoped that she would resort to passive animosity, allowing us to coexist without further incidents. However, it didn't take long for her hatred to manifest in an even more threatening manner. During a peaceful Sunday brunch with my family in our garden, the neighbor scaled the fence, brandishing a gun and pointing it directly at my face. Paralyzed by fear, I couldn't help but envision my life ending abruptly. Neighbor. I've called the police again due to all this noise. This neighborhood used to be nice until you came along, turning it into some slum. I don't know what lies you told them last time, but I know you don't really own this property. Me. I don't know what you want to hear, but... We legitimately purchased this house. Neighbor. Bull crap. I know you're kind. I'm confiscating this property for the town, and once the police arrive, they'll arrest you and send you back where you belong. I hope you enjoyed pretending to be high class because you'll end up in a jail cell or worse. Her gun silenced everyone, forcing us out of the garden and onto the street as we awaited the arrival of the police. One officer approached me, attentively listening to my side of the story while another entertained the neighbor's fabricated tale. She weaved an intricate lie, accusing us of breaking into her house and attempting to rob her at gunpoint. However, unbeknownst to her, I had installed security cameras that had captured her entire vile act. Presenting the footage to the police, I exposed her lies and demonstrated how she had intruded into our garden with weapons drawn. I explained that we were peacefully enjoying lunch when she aggressively barged in, the police had grown tired of her deceit and falsehoods. They asked if I wanted to press charges. Knowing that my state allowed for the use of force in self-defense, I considered my options carefully. However, I decided to focus on justice rather than revenge. What she had done was not only harassment, but also a hate crime. I firmly pressed charges against her, determined to hold her accountable for her racist actions. Within moments, I watched as my neighbor was handcuffed and placed in the back of a police car. The officers apologized for the trouble caused, assuring us that she would no longer be a nuisance. They encouraged us to enjoy the rest of our day and assured us that they were just a phone call away if any issues arose. As the police departed, my neighbor found herself in a world of trouble. The authorities became less concerned about her false accusations and more interested in the fact that the gun she brandished wasn't legally registered to her. With no license and no credible explanation for its origin, she faced serious legal consequences. She ranted about her supposed right to bear arms, claiming she needed protection against the dangerous criminals who had moved in next door. However, her excuses fell on deaf ears. The court sentenced her to community service, hoping that this punishment would serve as a wake-up call. 
They warned her that any future transgressions would result in more severe consequences, including imprisonment. She begrudgingly accepted the verdict, realizing that her hateful actions had brought her to this point. The next one is a pro-revenge story. This was in my grade 11 year of high school. My computer class had a year-long substitute teacher because our amazing teacher was out for a year working on a government contract. Our previous teacher was outstanding. He had six different classes in our classroom, all happening at the same time. Computer repair, programming level 1, programming level 2, networking level 1, networking level 2A, and level 2B. He would give a lecture for each of the classes on a specific day of the week. Programming on Monday, repair on Tuesday, and so on. We would all work in our own groups, and everything went quite well. The next year came around, and I found out that we had a sub for the year. I had two back-to-back blocks in this class because I was doing two courses. I wandered up to the class to see what kind of teacher we were dealing with, mainly interested because I was almost certain whoever they found did not have the credentials to teach at least half of those classes. The new teacher was a foreign woman that none of us had ever heard of before. For the purpose of the story, we will call her Mrs. S. I went and found my friends to tell them what I had seen. We were all optimistic, because from a very short conversation, she seemed quite informed and had a good background. It didn't last long. On the first day of class, Mrs. S. introduced herself as a programming teacher who had been in school for four years. She went on to tell us about her programming experience in Microsoft Excel and Microsoft Access. She then told us that the programming students would not be doing the Java and C++ course we had signed up for, and would instead be doing Database and Excel because those are what she learned, and she said, they will be more useful than C and Java. She also went on to suspend all lunch clubs because she didn't think high school students could be trusted with computers alone. Understandably, some of us were quite upset about that, considering that we came there to program. She also did not give the repair people or the networking people any kind of support, and completely stopped their lectures as well, preferring to let them figure it out themselves and self-teach without giving any of the resources to do so and occasionally throwing out a test pre-written by the last teacher for her. This continued for about two weeks until one day she came in and said quite irritated that we would actually be doing the Java now unless we wanted to keep doing database. So we switched to Java and she basically left us out to dry from there. Because she wasn't teaching database anymore, she came to harass people in computer repair. First, she told us the shop room was too messy and made us throw out 90% of our training workstations and equipment because they were not important in her eyes. Equipment that did not belong to the school but actually belonged to the other teacher. We took home what we could steal for safekeeping, but she did end up throwing out a few thousand dollars worth of equipment. Then she started imposing stupid rules on us, such as, You can't have the computer on while you are troubleshooting inside because you could electrocute yourself. Or, You don't need the case open to troubleshoot motherboard lights. Or my personal favorite and the most scary, Maybe you should change the power supply to 240V if you aren't getting enough power. We followed most of her stupid requests as much as we could because she threatened to lock us out of the lab room and give us only textbook work if we didn't. Needless to say, it was a challenging time. One of the students in the networking area got fed up and started doing his own coursework and lecturing to us, so that we could at least get some kind of use out of the courses. To his credit, it was all very good, but Mrs. S. had the audacity to force him into doing it from there on out, and then turn around and give him low grades for not getting his own work done on time. A few months of this very uneasy balance went by, and my mother came down with colon cancer. I had already had a handful of other family members suddenly taken from me by cancer, so understandably, this was a very stressful time. I was joking with my friends and trying not to break down over the whole thing. I had a very unstable laptop running Linux that would crash if looked at funny and had a horrible habit of corrupting the OS when the battery died because the reserve shutdown sensor didn't work anymore. The battery always read 0% but would go for an hour or two. While I was working on the school desktop computer, I had a few pages open that I was taking notes in, and a Facebook tab so I could keep in contact with my mother because she was in surgery, and I was waiting for her to come out. I looked over, and the teacher was snooping through my laptop, opening folders and closing windows, and eventually pushed the power button until it shut down, which also usually corrupted anything I was doing. The following happened. Me. 
What the hell do you think you are doing? Mrs. S. You shouldn't be on Facebook or writing notes on a personal computer during class time, especially when your grades are slipping. Thanks for bringing that up in front of everyone. Me. That gives you no right to touch my stuff. You better hope you didn't just corrupt everything. This laptop breaks easily. Mrs. S. Then you shouldn't have it out during class. Keep that tone up, and I'll see you get a detention. At this point, I am trying just to keep calm, because if I get too emotional, I have a tendency to explode. This is often made worse because of my mild autism. I took a second, replied in a calmer tone. Me. I'm sorry, I'm just having a hard time at home right now. My mother was diagnosed with colon cancer, and I am waiting to hear back. And this is the part that really set me off, Mrs. S. You don't look like a kid whose mother has cancer. Quit making sob story excuses. Are you kidding me? It took every fiber of my body not to stand up and slap the teacher right there. I gave her the dirtiest thousand-yard stare I think I have ever done while also trying not to burst out crying. I spoke to nobody for the rest of the day until I got home. People kept asking if I was okay, and I ignored everyone. My mother was out of the hospital and home by the time I got there. I broke down crying and told her about my day. Her face was comforting, but you could see the fire of an angry woman behind her brown eyes. She told me not to worry and that it would be okay. A few weeks passed and I was called into the office for a one-on-one -on -one parent-teacher conference. Someone forgot to tell me about. There were all the teachers I had that year, good and bad. My learning assistance teacher, the VP, and the principal herself. They told me that we were there to discuss my grade slippage as soon as my mother came. My mother was about ten minutes late, leaving me to awkwardly sit with all these people. She came in and was all smiles. Mother, sorry I am late. I got held up at the hospital. Someone, but I'm not sure who, asked her why she was at the hospital and if everything is okay. My mother answered in her happy way. Mother, I was just getting my cancer checked on because I have cancer. The room went cold and her voice seemingly dripped with blood when she said it. My computer teacher went pale and everyone in the room gave a confused, What on earth did you do, look? My mother proceeded to relay how I came home crying about how I was treated to everyone present, while Mrs. S. tried to become one with the wall of the small meeting room. She kept it short, but to paraphrase, she added the following, Mother, How dare you say something so careless to my son? I hope you are ashamed, and I hope you don't get invited back for another year. She then returned back to her normal happy self and discussed my grades like nothing happened, while half the teachers were still trying to figure out what just happened. My mother told them that now she was out of the hospital, my grades should improve again. I just sat quietly the whole time and tried to suppress bursting out laughing. After that day, Mrs. S. never directly spoke to me again. She had instructions relayed through other people or gave them to the class as a whole. She did her damnedest to be nowhere near me and say nothing to me. My grades improved quite a bit, and the year ended with me passing. Mrs. S. was previously offered a job at the school as a secondary computer teacher, but after all the trouble, the job was pulled back. The next year, when our first computer teacher returned, he was furious to learn most of his equipment and personal books had been thrown out. We returned the things that we snagged during the purge, but he still lost a few thousand dollars worth of personal teaching stuff. The school paid him back with $10,000, but he says he lost so much more than that in time and preset handmade equipment. We told him all about the horror show, and he gave us all an extensive test, normally given at the end of the year, which the vast majority of us failed. We ended up redoing all the computer courses from the previous year because, in his words, she didn't even teach us the basics. That sub can no longer teach in this or the neighboring districts. The next one is a petty revenge story. So I rent a house with my husband and two of our friends. It's a five-bedroom house. Rent is outrageous in our area. $2,400 for a one-bedroom apartment. So we found this house for $3,000. Not a bad deal while we save up to buy a house. There are other houses in the neighborhood like this as well. Our next-door neighbors have a five-bedroom house, and they have nine people living in it. So it is chaos over there all the time. In our neighborhood, we can choose the trash company. And it just so happens that we have the same trash company as the next-door neighbors. Our trash company wants us to have the trash out by 7 a.m. We don't always get it out that early, though, and that's where this problem started. Most of the time, they don't pick up our trash until 11 a.m., 
So as long as the trash is out before the trash pickup arrives, they can take our trash. The people next door have three trash cans, and they are overflowing every single week. They put their trash out the night before, but unfortunately our neighborhood has raccoons and foxes, so the trash is always getting into it. Last time a raccoon got into their trash and left a mess in our yard, but they wouldn't pick it up. I was pretty pissed about it, but I just let it go and cleaned up their trash. I did put it back in their trash can, and they just sat out front glaring at me while I did that. Here is where the incident started. A couple of weeks ago, I didn't get our trash out until almost 9 a.m. All four of us were sick with COVID. I was on the mend and feeling a little bit better, but I slept in and forgot to put out the trash at 7 a.m. So I went to put the trash out, and my neighbor started yelling at me, saying, You were supposed to have your trash out by 7 a.m. You can't put your trash out now. I said, well, they haven't come to pick up the trash because your trash cans are full, so it's not a big deal. He said, no, that's the rule. Your trash has to be out by 7 a.m. If it's not, you can't get your trash picked up this week. I said, I understand that they want the trash out by 7 a.m., but they haven't come to pick it up yet, so it doesn't matter. I went ahead and walked inside. I went back to bed, and a couple of hours later I got up to see that our trash cans were put to the side of the house and they were still full of trash. That means someone moved our trash cans. Our other neighbor came up to me the next day and said that she saw him put our trash can back. She didn't know the situation, so she wasn't going to butt in and tell him not to do that. Our neighbors are also very proud of their last name. They literally have a flag in their front window with their last name. So, I called the trash company and said that I was Mrs. So-and-so and and needed to set up a vacation hold for our upcoming pickup. They said, no problem, we won't pick up your trash next week. They only asked for the address, no other information. The next week, I made sure that our trash was out at 6.45 a.m. Then I sat and watched for the trash truck, and I saw them come past the house. They drove past my neighbor's house, didn't pick up their trash even though it was overflowing, picked up ours and the other few people who also had them, and left. I know I'm an a-hole for doing this, you don't need to tell me. I may have crossed the line, but he also crossed the line by touching our cans, moving them, and setting foot on our property. I'm adding an edit to mention that our lease is up at the end of this month, so we won't be dealing with these crazies for much longer. And if they mess with the house, good. My slumlord can deal with it. The next one is an entitled people story. I-17F feels so humiliated, I can't believe I'm writing this. So a couple of days ago, I went on a walk with my baby to a park. On the way back, I was pretty hungry and stopped by this cafe for a quick bite and ordered a soup. I paid and sat at a table, then the baby got fussy, and I knew it was time for her to eat. I had a bottle packed, but realized I accidentally left it at home, so I just gave her the boob. Then I heard a lady say, Are you serious? I didn't think anyone was talking to me, so I minded my own business because that's what you do when nobody's bothering you. Then I felt someone harshly tapping on my shoulder, and the same lady said, Excuse me? Annoyed that someone was hitting my shoulder, I turned around and said, Excuse you? Karen replied, That's inappropriate. You need to stop. I responded, Stop what? She said, Are you ducking stupid? Of course you are. That's probably why you have a baby so young. That was a good one. I'll give her that. She mentioned something about this being a public place and how she didn't like that I was exposing myself in front of her husband, who was sitting at the table next to us, watching his wife act stupid. She suggested I go to the bathroom to take care of that or something, and that I shouldn't bring a newborn baby, my baby is obviously too big to be a newborn, out in public anyway because of corona and stuff. She wasn't even wearing a mask and was all up in my face, so obviously not that concerned about corona. I wasn't going to the bathroom because that's weird, and I wasn't leaving because I was waiting for my soup. I tried to politely tell her that I'm not leaving and if she's worried about corona she should back up away from me and my baby, and everyone can mind their own business like normal people. She said, okay, I'm telling. How mature. She walked off and I looked over at her husband and he said, you should be more modest. I just cringed at him and looked away because I'm not about to argue with a grown man. The manager eventually came over and said I needed to stop or leave. I was kind of mind-blown because I thought kicking someone out for breastfeeding was illegal, but apparently not. I said, well, she's hungry, and she's going to cry if I stop, 
and I'm not leaving because I'm waiting for my soup, which they said would take 20 minutes because of something going on or whatever, and at this point, there would be about 15 minutes left. So, can I get a refund? He said they don't do refunds, but can give me restaurant credit like a gift card or something. But I'm definitely not going back there, so I won't need that. And I just left. Of course, Karen mumbled a few things about me being a slut or whatever to the manager, and I told her to shut up. Then she started screaming, but I walked out the door before I could hear her tirade on me, and the manager stopped her from following me. By the way, I'm in Los Angeles, which isn't a really conservative area. But yeah, that was my first experience with a Karen. The next one is an entitled parent story. Our household always revolved around money, even though my mom made more than enough money, and we were not struggling by any means. She complained about every single thing she had to buy for us, everything. Food, clothes, medical expenses, toys, laptops, phones, school costs, everything. We always knew exactly how much we were costing her. We didn't dare ask for unnecessary things like leisure activities, expensive toys, or hobby supplies. We started working very young, and she manipulated and guilted us into giving her all the money we earned to pay off what we owed. When I turned 18, she completely cut me off financially, but kindly offered to let me rent my bedroom out from her, and sent me an invoice of every cent I've ever cost her, totaling over $700,000. She billed me for Christmas and birthday presents. She even billed me for her medical expenses during the pregnancy and delivery, and wanted me to back pay rent to live in the house from birth. She did the same to my sister two years later, when she turned 18. We were supposed to pay her back over time starting the day we turned 18. Both of us were still dealing with a lot of internalized guilt from her constant manipulation, so we actually did pay for a while. Aside from necessary expenses, our entire paychecks were going to her. We rented our bedrooms in her house, and she separated her food, cleaning supplies, cookware, and tableware from ours and charged us to use them. She generously included the use of the household appliances in our rent. It wasn't until I was 21 and my sister was 19 that enough people had told us this whole arrangement was unhinged that we finally snapped out of it. We moved out together and have stopped paying our mom, or even contacting her at all. Thank you for watching, I would really appreciate it if you could like the video and subscribe to our channel if you haven't already. We'll see you again tomorrow.